In this video, I would like to show you how you can use a software called Location Visualizer to aggregate GPS data from a variety of sources, including online services, physical GPS or GNSS devices, visualize the data, annotate it with metadata, convert it into different formats, and so on. To start off, I will open a terminal, create a directory called demo within my user's home directory, and then we're going to check out the tool via Git, build it from source, and then configure it and see how we can use it. So first, let's open up a terminal and create our demo directory and navigate into it. Now let's check out the source code of the tool Location Visualizer. It's available on GitHub, so we use the following command, git clone https colon double forward slash github.com slash andre pxx slash location visualizer dot git. Now that we got the source, we can navigate into the directory that's just been created for us. And now we can build the application by running the make command. It will have a dependency to a graphics library called Sydney, which implements a special rendering process that's called abstract rendering. The build system will automatically resolve this dependency. If this fails for you, then you will need to install additional build tools like make and the Go compiler toolchain. Now that we have the application itself built, we can create the TLS keys that we need for the web interface to run. And for that, you type make keys. This will require OpenSSL to be installed. Now that we have TLS keys, we have to open up the configuration file in a text editor and make some adjustments. First, we replace the entry use map false. by use map true. And now we have to configure a map server so that we can have our data drawn on a baseline map. Fortunately, there's the OpenStreetMap project that's run by volunteers and provides worldwide map data. So I will just put in https colon double forward slash tile dot openstreetmap dot org slash, and then we have to use placeholders, dollar sign, opening curly brace, Z. Closing curly brace, slash, dollar sign, opening curly brace, X. Closing curly brace, slash, dollar sign, opening curly brace, Y. Closing curly brace, dot PNG. And then we can hit Control O to save the file and Control X to exit the editor. Note that I'm using a public tile server here from the OpenStreetMap project. And in fact, I did develop the software location visualizer, not only so that I can see where I've been and track my own activities, like, you know, I do running and cycling mainly, I run half marathon distance, marathon distance, and beyond. But I also developed it so that I can contribute to OpenStreetMaps. Now, as I said, I use a public tile server here for demonstration purposes. You should not use a public tile server for anything but testing and perhaps small, very low traffic private use. If you want to run this as a service for a large user base, please definitely host your own tile server. But back to where we were. So I told you I do a lot of endurance sports. 
as you know, I also make music. And I'm also a lot into urban exploration. You know, I live in Berlin for more than 11 years now, and it's a fascinating city. I really like to explore it. As you can probably imagine, there's a lot to see. And I often have visitors here, you know, other people coming to Berlin from other parts of Germany or even from other countries. They come for some events and stuff like that, you know. I know a lot of people. I have a large social network. You know, I came here 11 years ago, and initially I did not have my own apartment. So I was sharing an apartment with other people, you know, mainly other people who are newly arriving here. And there were special places where you could rent a single room with access to a shared kitchen and bathroom for duration starting from three months onwards. And, you know, the people were moving in and out of these places quite regularly, so you always got to know new people. Then, of course, I studied here at university, and I work here now as a research associate. I also play an instrument, do tech and audio engineering related stuff. And I'm involved in the local hacker and maker community here, in the LGBTIQ community, in volunteer and nonprofit work, of course, in the open source community. So I know a lot of people for all sorts of different reasons and with all sorts of different backgrounds, both here from Berlin, but also from other places, other cities in Germany, other countries, both inside and outside of Europe. And people are coming here all the time for some event, you know, a concert or a conference they attend, or just to visit the city. And then often they stay at my place or they stay somewhere else, say in a hotel nearby. Yeah, but definitely then I'll be their guide and show them the city since I've come around here so much. And of course, since I do this, I come around even more. I get to know even more people, make new connections, so it just keeps amplifying itself and keeps growing. And therefore, I generally come around a lot, both inside and outside of Berlin. When I, in turn, visit someone, or when I attend some event, go to a concert, attend an open source conference, where I present my work, and so on. And at some point, I read a paper from a US university about a technique for visualizing large data sets called abstract rendering. And then I thought, since I get around so much for all sorts of different reasons, it would be interesting to visualize that and see where I've been. And then I also check where I haven't been so far and see if there might be interesting places in those areas to explore. So that's the reason I started developing this application we're talking about. But sorry for the aside and back to topic now. So Location Visualizer is a server application. It will be started and run on your machine as a daemon and users can access it via a web browser. And it has user authentication. In fact, it has a pretty sophisticated challenge response based authentication scheme and a secure session management. It stores salted password hashes in its user database and it uses a zero knowledge proof so that the server can verify that the client knows the password without having the client ever transmit it, even over an encrypted connection. And of course, it has end-to-end -end encryption with perfect forward secrecy and elliptic curve cryptography and all the bells and whistles you'd expect from a modern application. So there's a lot of strong crypto going on in the background, but fortunately, we don't have to care about that too much. But what we have to do is create a user account and set a password for it. And I will not use secure credentials here since this is just for demonstration purposes and the server will not be publicly accessible. But in principle, the crypto is really strong. So let's create the user now for our demo. So I went out of the config directory again with cd dot dot, and then I typed dot slash lockviz create minus user username, which will create a user with a name set to username. And of course, if you want to create your own user, you replace the username with a name of your choice. Next, let's set a password. So I typed dot slash lockviz set minus password username secret, which will set the password of the user with the name username to secret. Now, obviously, as I said, 
if you want to run this as a public server, you choose a much stronger password here. Now we have to give the user some permissions. So I type dot slash logviz at minus permission. And then I type the name of the user. So in our case, username. And then I type the name of the permission I want to give to the user. And the first permission I want to give is called get minus tile. And now I just hit the arrow up button, then I get the last command again, and then I replace the permission with the permission render. Hit enter again, and then I repeat this process. Next permission I give is called activity minus read. Then activity minus write. then geodb minus read, geodb minus write, and finally geodb minus download. And now we're basically set and can run the service. And for that, we type dot slash logviz without any more parameters and hit enter. All right, so I just made a cut and continue recording on another day, but we're in the same state as before. I just changed the resolution of the monitor I capture the video from to 1080p so that it fits better to the resolutions that YouTube supports. So a location visualizer now runs as a daemon in the background, and we can open a browser and connect to it. And now we have to accept a certificate warning and log in. So we type username then we can hit enter and the cursor will advance into the password field. And now we type the password, which was secret, and hit enter and then we will log in. So in the background now there has been some sophisticated crypto going on. If you want, you can inspect the data that is exchanged during the login process using the network analyzer in your browser. Now we see the map background. This is data from OpenStreetMaps. And now we can open the sidebar and we see a lot of stuff we can do there. You can see there are a lot of options for navigation and filtering the data and stuff like that. You can see that we can change the intensity and color mapping for the map background. So I will just demonstrate this. You can adjust the intensity down. And of course also upwards. And you can see the brightness of the map change. And we can also go to original and then it will just show the original map as it is, co as it is coming from OpenStreetMaps. So it will not be mapped to these dark colors. Now let's get some data into this. So click on the GeoDB button here, which opens the interface to the geographical database that's integrated into Location Visualizer. And now you can select the data format you want to import. We have support for CSV, so comma-separated values, GPS exchange or GPX, and records JSON. This is not GeoJSON, it is a JSON-based format that is used by several online services like Google Maps or Google Takeout, and also by more modern GPS devices, often in addition to the older XML-based GPX format. You know, in general, there's a tendency away from XML-based formats, 
XML is often considered quite a legacy and heavyweight towards JSON-based formats, which are often regarded as more lightweight and modern. So we support all of this here, and we can import from it and export to it. And we can also export into the OpenGeoDB binary file format, which we also use internally for storage. Under this import strategy dropdown, you can select what data you want to import. Do you want to import all data points? Do you only want to import data points that are newer than the current latest or the most recent data point in the database? Or do you not want to import any data at all? The last option is useful if you just want to get some statistics on the data you upload, since you will get an import report even if you didn't actually import anything. So you can sort of preview your data before you actually modify the contents of the database. What we currently cannot do yet is clear the database from within the web interface. For that, you terminate the server, delete the database file, and have an empty database created on the next start of the application. We will probably implement this in the future, but we want to safeguard against accidental deletion of data. So this will probably get its own permission and you will probably have to confirm a hash of the database contents when clearing it to make sure that the database contents did not get modified by someone else uploading geodata during the time you spent here on the interface deciding to clear it. Okay, so let's grab a file with geodata in it. This one is in records JSON format and let's import it. Since our database is empty, we can just import all data. Yeah, and now you see some statistics here. This is the import report. You have some statistics on the database content before and after the import about the data you actually uploaded for import and the data points that were actually imported, which is interesting, of course, if you decide not to import all data points. Let's close the import report. And you also have some statistics over here. So you can see I've been recording for more than eight years now and have almost a million data points here. So let's get back to the map view. And you can see this is really fast. Remember, we're visualizing about a million data points here. So this is a trip to Australia that you can see here. I've been in Australia in 2019 and also in 2023. And now you can go over here and open the sidebar again. And then you can see lots of statistics here, like where we currently are on the map in a variety of coordinate systems, like geographical coordinates in degrees, minutes, and seconds, including fractional seconds, dimensionless northing and easting, and also northing and easting in kilometers. 
And you also have boxes over here that you can use to filter the data based on time. You can put ISO timestamps here for beginning and end. Or you can put some other expressions here, like just a year. or year and month. Or year, month, and day. Let's go, go back to a full timestamp. And you can use all of this together with a time zone. Either use Z or use plus minus something. Or you can use notation with space and UTC. or space and GMT. Or you can vary the case. And you can also combine the time zone with uh, just the date. Or just uh, year and month. Or uh, just the year. So you see we have a lot of flexibility here. And over here you see this activities button. Here you can add metadata to your actual location data. 
It will be stored separately from your location data, but the two will be correlated by timestamps. When we click on the Add button, we will insert what is called an activity group. Now, the concept of activity groups is not that easy to explain and probably not that intuitive either, but once you get the hang of it, it is actually quite useful. An activity group is a section in time in which activities are performed, and unless you are dead, you are pretty much always active in some way or another, since you will always do something, you know, whether that is running or cycling, which are activities for which we have separate attributes here, or whether that's something else like eating or sleeping or dancing or doing whatever, you know, unless you are dead, you will always have some sort of metabolic rate going on, which means your body and therefore you are doing something, right? That's the reason why an activity group only has a begin timestamp, but no end timestamp. The activity groups will automatically be sorted by their begin timestamps, and they will implicitly end when the next activity group starts, since unless you are dead, there's no way you cannot do at least something. Activity groups therefore divide your entire timeline, so your entire life, or at least the time span you want to cover or capture here in Location Visualizer into segments. And then for each of these segments, you specify which amount of time you spent running or cycling and add some other attributes like the weight you had at some point within that activity group, distance is covered, the number of steps taken, the amount of energy consumed performing different activities, and then for the rest of the duration of that segment, you performed other activities, which can be anything really. So the only thing we can say about it is how much energy you consume during the time that this segment or activity group covers where you were not performing a more specific activity, namely running or cycling. So if you fill some data in here, we can create an activity group I'm just filling in some made up data now. And then we can add the activity group. And you can see that the begin timestamp will now be a link. And if you click on that link, it will actually pre-fill the filter attributes and apply the filter. So that on the map view, we see exactly the time that is covered by that particular activity group. And we also have aggregate statistics over all activity groups down here, so you can see which distances and times and so on you had in total. So for me, an activity group is always a day, which might not necessarily be 24 hours, since there might be daylight saving changes or time zone changes when I travel. But really, the concept of activity groups is flexible. So if you run a marathon on one day, let's say, you could easily have an activity group covering the time before the run an activity group for the actual run, and then an activity group for the rest of the day after the run. It's really up to you. An activity group is just a section of time for which you can specify certain attributes. And down here you can see you can do a CSV export of your activity data for use with spreadsheet or data analysis applications. And you also have the opportunity to import CSV data. The CSV will have one row per activity group and then it will contain the individual attributes of each activity group in the separate columns. Now, Location Visualizer has a lot more functionality that I did not cover in this tutorial. For example, you can export your map tiles from the tile cache to an archive or import map tiles from an archive into the tile cache and so on. If you're tech savvy, I suggest you just fiddle around with this. There's actually a lot of stuff you can do with it. Some final notes from my side. I started tracking my weight on 12th of May 2016, my activities on 6th of June 2016, and my location on 16th of June 2016. So I have about eight years of continuous records now. Up till 21st of June 2024, this amounts to almost a million unique GPS or GNSS data points, more than 
42,800 kilometers, so more than once around the equator, or more than 1,000 marathons running, and more than 9,700 kilometers, so almost 10,000 kilometers cycling. I did the tracking with different apps and devices, most of the apps that I use store data locally, and I integrate and manage all my data with Location Visualizer. This is open source software. It's under a permissive license, Apache License 2.0 to be precise. I hope you enjoy my work. If you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to comment. Of course, you can also contribute to the project on GitHub. Apart from that, Pride season 2024 is now upcoming in Berlin. It kicks off on the legendary Stonewall Day on 28th of June and will go on for exactly one month to 28th of July, culminating one day earlier on 27th of July in the official Berlin Pride or Christopher Street Day celebrations, as we call it in Germany. Since I'm quite involved in the queer community myself, that means I will have a very busy time ahead now. I hope some of you will come to Berlin and celebrate with us, show your support and solidarity in difficult times with the challenges we face all around the world. And despite all that, I hope we will all have a safe and fun time ahead of us. Thank you very much for your time and hope to see you soon.